Hi, I'm Robert Wright. I run the Non-Zero Foundation, which produces all the shows on Blogging Heads TV and Meaning of Life TV. We host a variety of voices, some of them pretty unorthodox, and we encourage dialogue that is sharp but civil. We think fostering constructive conversation is especially important now that America and the world are looking kind of fragile. If you agree that our mission is important, I hope you'll consider helping us shoulder the cost. You can do that by becoming one of our cherished patrons at patreon.com slash nonzero foundation. That's N-O-N-Z-E-R-O-F-O-U-N-D-A-T-I-O-N. Thanks. We need your help, and we deeply appreciate it. Milton Lawson, good to see you. Thanks for having me. Hello. Welcome to everyone in the Sophia audience. Uh, this is the Sophia program available on streaming video, audio podcast. Uh, I welcome everyone at uh, bloggingheads.tv, meaningoflife.tv. I am very pleased once again to be joined by my uh, friend and uh, co-enthusiast, Milton Lawson. Um, I am a professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, and I publish an online magazine called The Electric Agora. Milton, why don't you give us your little spiel and also maybe include your, your newest thing that's happening or not. I couldn't ga- quite gather from all the exchanges what stage of it's happening or not happening it's at, but go ahead and give you a little introduction and maybe pitch that. Or Yeah, I, um, I'm a comic book writer based in Houston, Texas, and uh, this uh, October, I believe, my debut published miniseries is going to be published uh, by SourcePoint Press and Comics Experience. It's called Thompson Heller Detective Interstellar. I'm very excited about that. Um, That's a great title. Thank you, thank you. (laughs) One of the reasons that I'm very excited about it is um, the artist on it is about to blow up big time. He just completed the official centennial graphic novel for um, Charlie Parker, um, and it's going to be considered by most people with good taste the best comic graphic novel collection of the year, if there's any justice. And then one month later, he's got a book with me coming out. So I'm going to hope to ride on his coattails. Nice. Um, I have have one other big thing in the works, but I can't really fully talk about it. I think that's the one I was thinking about. Yeah. Okay. All right. That one, we got information blackout for now. Um, (laughs) um, Maybe maybe the next time we talk, you'll be able to – you'll be freed from your non-disclosure agreements or whatever they are um, right, right. to talk about that. But I thought that the other one is quite exciting too. So um, um, we are here today to have a discussion, a sort of an overarching discussion about the MCU uh, for those not in the know, the Marvel comics universe. Um, and the broad focus is going to be, What is it that, how did the MCU accomplish what it accomplished? Because in my view, this is arguably the the greatest cinematic accomplishment, just in terms of the sheer scope, complexity, scale, and then box office success of it, um, that I can think of. I can't think of anything this big, this complex, this successful uh, that's happened before. And then we're also going to talk a little bit, speculate about uh, the future, uh, about the future phases of the MCU. I was under the impression that four, five, and six were all mapped out, but then Milton uh, educated me that only four is mapped out, and all those five and six maps that you see all over the interwebs are just fanboy fakes, which, of course, is embarrassing to me, but not surprising given how old I am. Um, but, Milton, before we start on Marvel, there was one thing that you and I spoke about privately that I wanted you to just uh, convey your knowledge about because it excited me so much, and I think it may excite uh, the audience. And that's over on the DC side of the ledger. I I saw appearing in my feeds in multiple places that Michael Keaton is going to be brought back to play Batman, which really excited me because, in my view, that first Burton uh, Batman movie with Keaton hit the sweet spot of the perfect way of treating Batman in my view, better than the Nolan and better than the prior more goofy uh, sort of Adam Westy type things. Um, but I don't quite understand how this is supposed to be happening because I was under the impression that it had been handed off from Ben Affleck to 
Pattinson. Right. Um, and so could you just say, tell us what you know about this thing with Keaton and how this is supposed to go? And is it going to be part of the DCU or is this an entirely separate thing they're doing? What do you know about it? The only thing that seems to be confirmed from decent reporting is that they're going to kind of tiptoe the approach. And Michael Keaton is only in talks at the moment. They haven't been consummated, but in talks to have a guest starring role in a feature film focused on the flash and the flash would theoretically be played by Ezra Miller from the justice league movie. And there's a little bit of concerns there because cancel culture has wanted to cancel that dude. Um, so and he is, so that's not him. the same guy who plays the flash in the show, which right. I gather was somewhat is somewhat successful, right? The, the flash show. Yeah, yeah, I think they're on season six, I think, yeah, at this yeah. point. Yeah, yeah. So the one in the films, the DCU films, is not the same actor, um, but it's whoever is the actor in Justice League, they're going to now build, what, a franchise of films around that actor slash character? They're going to have several flashes? Like the way um, they MCU's had several Captain Americas and several Iron Man. Is that what they're planning? Um, I think that... In theory, they're still the same Flash. They're still Barry Allen, but they're just different universes. They don't touch each other. And this will potentially get even more confusing because the Robert Pattinson Batman uh, series is apparently going to be its own little hermetically sealed universe. Oh, so that's not going to be part of DCU. That's the, the, that's the understanding among reporters at the moment, but this is all very fluid. So um, these discussions with uh, Michael Keaton, the idea that they're framing it is if the Flash guest starring role is successful, they might have Michael Keaton appear in more DC movies as kind of an elder statesman Batman, sort of replicating the role that Samuel L. Jackson played in the Marvel Universe. As Nick Fury. Right. Uh, so, So just to be clear, and then we'll move on to MCU, Affleck is out. Right? As Batman? Yes. Okay. Yes. Pattinson is going to be a self contained Batman, not part of DCU. So if this Keaton thing goes through, the next Batman after Affleck is going to be Keaton. Yes. But he's not going to be in action. He's going to be in a in a more background role. Presumably. Okay. I'm I, I'm of course enthusiastic and optimistic that They'll come up with some scene to give him a little bit of an action moment, but he'll probably be – I don't know if you're familiar with the uh, Batman Beyond concept. Is, is that, that, is that the anim- animated? Yeah. I have and not that watched one, that. I'm woefully un- uneducated on all these animated series that people are telling me I need to watch that because they're some of the best, apparently. It's, it takes place in a, in a future where Bruce Wayne is elderly and – basically just sits at a computer in the Batcave and sends off this younger Batman to do all of the the hijinks. So there may be another Batman in addition to Keaton, who's sort of playing a younger new prodigy, sort of, sort of like a new person taking on the mantle, and then Keaton is sort of the advisor, that sort of thing? That could be one angle as well. Interesting. Interesting. You know, I was thinking maybe you and I need to do another dialogue on – why the MCU worked and the DCU seems not to be working. Um, we could talk about that on another occasion. <laughs> um, but let's get into the uh, let's get into MCU. Um, um, first of all, do you agree with me that this is a pretty unprecedented and remarkable achievement? The the phase one through three, what they did. Yes, and and I I think one of the remarkable aspects of it, um, I think all of the people involved maybe had hopes and dreams that it could expand to, to a very large degree, but it was very organic in its uh, progression. So um, I, I feel it, I don't believe that Kevin Feige knew from the get go, every little step uh, in the chain from 2008 when they made the first couple of films. So it was not like Babylon 5 where the entire thing was written ahead of time. This, in a sense, was go- developing as it went along and then miraculously somehow came out as if it had been written entirely from the beginning, right? I mean, because yeah. usually, like, thinking about a show like The X-Files, right? 
it, it eventually really started to hurt it that it had not been sort of conceived all at one, from the beginning. You could, it start to, started to sort of come off the rails in various places. That yeah. seems to me to have not happened here. And given that now you're saying it was not premeditated, this thing evolved organically. They made Iron Man and they're like, well, we're not sure where this is going after this. That's really incredible um, 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 that it never sort of came apart, stayed so tight and culminated in such a tight way in the, uh, the last of two Avengers movies. Um, um, so we both agree. This is a remarkable accomplishment. Why don't you start talking? You have some, you have some um, views about why, why it managed to do this so well. And something also to do with the, the mission statement of the MCU that you, that, that you thought was worth, worth talking about. So why don't you go ahead and talk about both of those. Yeah, I don't know if uh, Kevin Feige or anybody at Marvel Studios ever put to paper an official mission statement um, or if it was just their instincts, but I believe that there was a mission uh, in the approach that Marvel Studios took that sets it apart from any other comic book movie that happened until they took over in 2008. And I'm going to get there, but I'm going to start with a very roundabout example uh, one of my favorite stories about the film director, Stanley Kubrick, um, you know, he was so secretive. There's not a lot known about him. And uh, one of the juicy tidbits that came out about him was one of his assistants talked about what it was like to work with him when he was between films and when he didn't have his next film chosen. And this assistant told the story of Kubrick would go to the bookstores just buy, buy stacks and stacks of novels uh, of things that look like they could be interesting to him. And then he'd go hole up in his office and the assistant would be sitting there on their desk and they would hear in the background, thunk, thunk, thunk. And that was the sound of Kubrick going through these novels. And as soon as they lost his interest, throwing them on the ground. And there were just these piles and piles of books in Stanley Kubrick's office at the end of the day. And I think that a lot of our most gifted filmmakers view source material in a sort of way to where it's almost like a, a natural resource that they're mining. It's, and they're bringing their talent and their vision and they're, they're going to, they're going to use it as fuel to create this, this new synthesized experience on the screen. But I think Marvel has taken it to the, uh, to a completely different uh, method, they've reversed that concept. They said, no, 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 no. We're, we're not providing you material that you're going to synthesize with all your pre-existing uh, aesthetics and everything to build something onto the screen. We're going to use cinema and your talents to bring the audiences into the Marvel Universe. We are going to uh, create a relationship where we're not here to serve you, the filmmaker. You're here to serve us, Marvel. And somehow, miraculously, they got some of these incredibly talented filmmakers on board with that transaction. And once people got on board with it, they, every, there was this sense of camaraderie. There was this team. And uh, there was this uh, kind of loose collaboration between all of the different directors. And Marvel used a very iterative and sometimes improvisational technique to where they were just jamming all these things out. And uh, I think staying true to the source material was their guiding light. So I know from interviews that some of the actors um, had no background or interest in comics. Yeah. What you described, though, makes it sound to me like the directors must all have at least been in – Marvel enthusiasts. Otherwise, I don't see how that could have how that could have unfolded the way. Is that the case that the directors that were picked were all were all already comic book fans, or or is it even more no. miraculous than that? It's even more miraculous than that because I th I think the only hardcore fanboy types were uh, John Favreau at the beginning, then Joss Whedon at the crucial phase of the first Avengers movie. Um, I think most of the other folks just brought their own talents and sensibilities, but once they bought into it, um, you know, Marvel would present all of these prospective filmmakers 
with packages of the history of the characters, showing them concept art, saying this is what this character is all about, do some research, see what you think about it. Um, and uh, they would oversee it. And the fact that they had one producer who had oversight authority on everything kept everything unified. Do you know anything about what the back in the background, the relationship was between the, um, between the comic makers and the people doing the films? In other words, was this all, all, all ultimately under the jurisdiction of the, the comic people or was this an entirely separate infrastructure? It started out that way where there was a, there was an advisory board um, of key Marvel comics writers at the time in early like 2007 when they were making the first Iron Man and they brought them on sort of as a consulting uh, class and they would, they would consult on everything scripts, concept art, casting. Um, but mainly they would talk with the directors about, you know, character beats and character moments and what is true to a character in the comics and everything. And they did that for the first, I think, three or four years. Um, but then once the Avengers movie shattered all of the box office records, um, I think the studio recalibrated and said, you know what, this guy, Kevin Feige, he knows what he's doing. Uh, we don't need a committee of voices. Uh, and we're just going to trust in this guy. And he's going to guide the ship. Here's the reason I ask. When I think of comparisons, and like we said, what MCU's done is unprecedented. But when I grope for comparisons, the closest I can get is Jackson's Lord of the Rings. Mm -hmm. And I could have seen how that could have become something almost as impressive as the MCU if, you know, in addition to the Lord of the Rings and the Hobbit, and you have then you have the Sil Silmarillion, right? And these are all that you know, the Silmarillions are vast. You know, you could make a get a lot of filmmaking out of that. But the reason why that sort of didn't work was it struck me that the studio, the people who, the people above Jackson were um, in a sense um, imposing upon him creative decisions with respect specifically to the Hobbit that made no sense relative to the source material. In other words, the reason it didn't work what I was wondering was whether is the reason MCU worked so well is because the people who created the original source material ultimately had authority over the production. Whereas in the case of Lord of the Rings, Tolkien's obviously dead. His estate is not involved in filmmaking and stuff like that. And the people who were making film just making decisions and, and on, on top of Jackson um, were not themselves in any way educated in Tolkien lore or invested in Tolkien lore and thus completely sort of blew the Hobbit, made Jackson blew the, blow the Hobbit. Um, that's what I was sort of asking, why I was asking you about the role played by the comics people in the MCU, w wondering whether that's why it ended up so good, right? Because they never let it get out of the hands of the people who actually created the source material. Yeah, I think it's, I think it's like one degree separated more than... Uh, your example, though, just in the sense that, you know, Stan, you know, Jack Kirby has passed I away. Mean, Jack Kirby was not. Yeah, yeah. 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 And like even Stan Lee, I mean, his role is just to show up one day a year and, and film his cameo. He doesn't have any creative. In, he didn't have any creative input. Um, but the people who did have final say were the custodians of those characters. They, you know, Marvel Studios, and they had a vested interest in representing them correctly, accurately, and true to the tradition and the, the future. Material. To the source material and then where they went. Okay. Um, so in that sense also, the, the remarkable accomplishment is partly due to remarkable circumstances that are rarely going to be repeatable, right? Yeah. Where you have the institutions related in this such a way such that the quality control remains very tight and high and lore, lore, um, loyal in a sense. Um, 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 in that sense, it's actually a great thing that the film studio was created with, from within Marvel, right? That it was not a, mm -hmm. not an outside studio such that executives who have no connection or, or investment in the material could impose all sorts of things on 
that the franchise that would then in a sense break it or weaken it or, 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 or yeah, yeah, no, that, that makes a lot of sense. All right. So now talking more specifically, so both of you and I rewatched all of the films, right. From phase one through three. And in a sense, the way I view this is that the culminating experience experiences are the Avengers films. All the other films are bits and pieces, right? That, that, that wind up coming together into those films, right? Into those, 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 those culminating films. How, why did that work so well? Um, (laughs) You know, in other words, it really, I mean, you know, you can't get much farther away from like, you know, the Iron Man film than like the Ant-Man film. Right. Um, um, And yet, there's not one piece, or the Guardians of the Galaxy, there's not one piece of it that A, doesn't seem to fit, and B, that you can't trace its direct relevance and input into the culminating experiences. Why? Is it just a, a luck, or how the hell did they do that? Well, I think they deserve tons of credit for it. I think this is one of the most important decisions that they made from the very beginning. They said, we're going to take the risk that even if one of our properties is deemed unsuccessful, we are going to stand behind it as being part of an interconnected universe. The concept of an interconnected universe was from the very first film. The very first film at the tail end, they have uh, Nick Fury, Samuel L. Jackson come after the credits and tell Iron Man, he's not the only one. And each one of these films was designed in such a way that um, they were, even though they didn't have A to Z from Iron Man to Endgame planned out, at each step along the way, they knew enough about what was coming and what was kind of contemporaneous to where they could uh, they could make uh, Easter egg nods or specific plot point uh, overlaps. Um, and so they, since they made that commitment, uh, that unprecedented uh, choice, um, it, it just paid off in those culminations in, in, in such a fabulous way. Um, you, you mentioned a number of specific elements. Storytelling, what you called specific great decisions, um, mm-hmm. having to do with storytelling, creative personnel, um, Casting, right? Maybe you could mention just across some of the films what you think some of those great, de- specific great decisions were that contributed to the success of the overall. I think, I think uh, the first one I would mention is just the choice to start with Iron Man. Um, and why, retros- why was that so important? What, it's like if you would have asked me to guess where you should start, I would have said Captain America, right? Mm-hmm. A, because of his visibility, and B, because it brings you back to the origin story, right? At begin of the whole thing, right? Back in the Second World War with the Red Skull and the Cosmic Cube and all that, and that, all that sort of stuff. Why do you think actually it was smart to start with Iron Man rather than Captain America? I think it was uh, perfect timing, uh, both in terms of filmmaking technology, uh, also... Um, it's it's hard for almost anyone who uh, is is paying attention to pop culture these days to even be aware of this fact. But Iron Man was a C-list character uh, from the Marvel universe from most people's perspectives in the in the history of the comics. He was never one of the best sellers. All the best selling comics were usually uh, Fantastic Four, the X Men, Spider Man, um, and so. Uh, you know, Iron Man's vis- uh, visibility was not as an individual title, but in the Avengers comic. Right, he uh, was he, Iron Man. Tony Stark was the leader of the Avengers, at least for a good portion of the, my comic experience of it, which would have been mostly in the seventies. Um, um, and um, he was a key member. Was he? A so, so he was important. I always thought of him as very important within the Avengers. But you're right. Mm-hmm. I guess the actual independent comics. Yeah, we're, we're not. I wouldn't call them obscure, but we're not right. 
as big as the Captain America comics or the Hulk comics or the Thor comics, right? Right. Yeah. yeah I, 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 I don't have the data to back this up, but I bet if you look at the monthly sales chart from the 70s and 80s, most time periods, Iron Man probably would not crack the top 10. Uh, but the one thing that Mar- uh, Iron Man has as a as a cinematic possibility is it is the one quote unquote superhero story that seems most plausible in today's world. You have these futurists who are building these amazing bits of technology. You know some of the robotics things that we see YouTube videos of are pretty chilling and crazy, and the notion that um, you know, this character is going to fly around in his man-made, uh, genius-made suit and shoot weapons that we can understand. It doesn't involve any magic. It doesn't involve any multiple dimensions. It's a very grounded uh, experience, both in terms of the character and in terms of the visual effects. In fact, I, I remember when Iron Man came out, um, I, I used to work for Blogging Heads and I edited the videos, there was a discussion uh, on uh, foreign policy where one of the uh, foreign policy thinkers said, this is how we should do our war on terror. We should have men in suits, you know, individually embedding and, you know, being protected from uh, harm's way and all of this kind of stuff. So it, the plausibility and groundedness of it um, is, I think, much more able to be received by a wider audience. Um, and do you, you think in a sense, I mean, I don't want to make this analogy too strong since there's so many points of disanalogy, but in that sense, he's a little bit like the MCU's Batman. He doesn't actually yeah. have any superpowers. Right. He doesn't, you know, what he has is a very brilliant mind, um, a great deal of wealth, <laughs> um, in, in institutional sort of wealth, um, and a bunch of technology, right? Yeah. And, and and he's a real a real guy in the similar way that 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 Bruce Wayne Wayne is supposed to be sort of a real guy you know, with a real backstory, real personality issues, real sort of you know. Yeah. And when yeah. and when Iron Man two thousand eight came out, um, you know this is right around the ascendance of the iPhone and Steve Jobs as this tectonic figure in history. Um, so a figure like that being yeah. a quote unquote superhero, I think was just cosmically timed. Yeah, that Steve Jobs analog is really, really a good one. And let me just ask you one thing while we're on Iron Man. Um, surely I think the casting also had an enormous thing role to play in this, right? I mean, I, yes. at this point, it's impossible to imagine anybody else playing it other than Robert Downey Jr. And his acting is so good that he could take something that in many ways you don't expect great performances from these kinds of genre films. Right. And yet here you have this really first rate actor. Yeah. Who's lending all of his skill to this, which just took something that would have already been great and made it really distinctive, right? I mean, yeah. The casting choices. But how do you do? You, I generally think the casting across the MCU was outstanding. Are you generally, are you, do, you, do you like the casting across the films? Yeah, um, Cumber, Cumberbatch uh, is brilliant as 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 freaking Doctor Strange. I, I I can't imagine anyone else doing that either. Um, but I think all of them. Um, um, uh, the guy, what's his name? Uh, Evans, right? Yeah, fantastic. Helmsworth, fantastic. Like, is there any weak casting in that in that in this year? Especially not in the big three. The big three, I think, are uh, almost miraculous in in their in their casting. Um, and I think Hemsworth actually is a little underrated on this point. Everybody recognizes Robert Downey Jr. as the, the biggest star in the world from these franchises. And Chris Evans, you know, ability to just exude integrity and moral centeredness and, you know, values and strength. You know, he, he just – he has that so innate and everything. But what Hemsworth was tasked with doing and going back through the MCU recently really – open my eyes to this is he has to deliver such a crazy range of uh, capabilities. You know, he's got the heightened sort of Shakespearean aspect when he's in Asgard in the early days and it was directed by Kenneth Branagh. So he had some of that theatricality and heightened language to him. Uh, But he also had to be kind of a blowhard 
and, um, you know, a dude with swagger. Um, and then as the character progressed, he got sort of ironic and self-mocking. And by the end of Endgame, he's got this Lebowski uh, imitation. Uh, and he's just, uh, uh, he's just phenomenal in the role. Yeah. No, I agree. A lot of a, a decent number of people kind of hated on the Fat Thor thing. Um, um, I didn't quite understand what people disliked about it so much. Um, 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 I, I happen to say, I think also, I mean, even some of the the secondaries. I thought that what's it, is it? Paul Rudd, the guy who plays Ant Man. Oh yes, yes, Fan- fantastic casting. Um, 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 even some of the secondary characters, I think. The, the the girl who plays Scarlet Witch, um, obviously Scarlett Johansson just is incredibly good as Black Widow. Um, I was never interested in the Black Widow character in the in the comics themselves, in the way that I became interested because of Scarlet, and not just because she's freaking gorgeous, and you and you you know it's 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 pleasant to watch her you know leaping and jumping around in a cat suit, but the actual character had serious gravitas and depth. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. um, that, that was, it, that was brought out little by little as, you know, um, so I, I think even the, 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 I, I think, um, what's his name is Hawkeye is terrific. Um, mm-hmm. um Your just, just, it's an incredible, uh, in, incredible job casting. Um, what about weeks, but like, what, what are the, do you see anything not great? <laughs> Mm-hmm. In phase one through three, anything you didn't like, anything you think didn't quite work. I mean, within the frame that we think the overall, the whole thing is a, a, a unprecedented success. What about it? What did you think maybe were weak spots? Um, I'm going to probably be accused of cheating here because some of my weak spots are kind of outside of the boundaries of what most people would consider this. Um, I do think um, a lot of the Netflix TV shows that they, they did that are considered part of the Marvel cinematic universe in a sort of tangential way. Um, A lot of them were really well done. um, And those experiences uh, were, were fantastic on their own. But I think in retrospect, now that Disney plus is a thing, um, it probably would have been much better for the long term of the Marvel universe to just hold off on all of those characters and wait until phase four, five and six um, to deploy those. Are you talking about specifically all the individual pieces that then came to make up the defenders? Yes, yes. And most of those I enjoyed. Uh, Luke Cage, Iron, um, Iron Fist, Iron Fist um, Jessica Jones, Daredevil. Yes. Now, Daredevil was thought was a very highly regarded show. Yeah, I, I, I enjoyed that quite a lot. And Jessica, Jessica Jones, Jones I- was as well, right? Yeah. Yeah, it was it was Iron Fist and Power, Power Man was his original name. I guess they call it Luke yeah. Cage now. Yeah. Um, that were considered to be weaker, and then the overall Defenders was considered to be quite weak. Yeah, is that is that? Do you share that view? Yeah, I share that view. Uh, the Luke Cage show it had a lot of brilliant moments, and it was definitely worth the going through the journey. Um, but um, overall, it was kind of disappointing. I, I was afraid, uh, not the fault of the of the cast, the the uh, the gentleman they had playing Luke Cage. I thought he was incredible. Um, and uh, another another TV opportunity that I didn't invest very far in. I only watched two episodes. Was the Agents of Shield show? No, I so thought that they- show was very good. Um, well, you did. It- and, I heard it got better. And it intersected with the films in a way that really worked. I mean, that whole Hydra takeover of S.H.I.E.L.D. played out both in the films and in the show in a parallel fashion that I thought worked really, really well. Okay. Um, I, I've, I've heard that a number of times, and I just disliked the first few episodes so thoroughly that I never got on board to – continue on uh, at some point. I'm sure I, I, I'll uh, revisit yeah. that. Yeah. What, what, what did, why do you think the defenders didn't work? Well, um, I think that project just in particular seemed like it was a, Hey, this worked for the Avengers. This is a formula that will succeed. And whoever put it together, 
um, was just, you know, limited to jamming on what was on those Netflix shows and just pieced it together. Whereas the very first Avengers film written and directed by Joss Whedon was a vision of a person that grew up with these characters, loved these characters, um, you know, hit every possible note from every macro level choice, like setting it in New York city uh, to the truths about the individual characters. Um, The defenders just felt like a, Hey, we we're doing this because, because we signed a contract to do this. There didn't seem to be any sort of story rationale for it. Um, it did, just, the, did the shows, did the TV MC stuff not fall under the same leadership? Sort of, in other words, was it not governed in the same way by the comics people? Is that was that the problem? Um, there, there seems to be conflicting interpretations on this. Like at the time, they said. You know, we're sending an official Marvel person there, and Jeff Loeb, who has has quite a history in comics, both in uh, Marvel and DC, was sort of like the godfather overseeing all of this stuff. Um, and he was supposed to be similar to Kevin Feige on the TV side, and and they made good stuff. I'm I'm not uh, I'm not going to criticize the, the majority of what they made. You know, some of them, the first season of Jessica Jones was just sublime. I mean, it was one of the best seasons of television I've ever seen. Uh, but in retrospect, it'd be awesome to do that later. I would think. Yeah. Yeah. Let me ask you one more thing about this before we, before we move on um, to the future, to the future. Um, and again, this may just be my age. The answer may be very simple or, or you may not know it. Um, how did Marvel go about deciding which versions of these things they were going to produce? So let me just give you two examples. Okay. Um, now, as a con, like I said, you know, I, I grew up and was a comic enthusiast during the Silver Age. And so I collected the Defenders, right? The members of the Defenders were no, did not really very much resemble the members of the Defenders that are in the show. I mean, Sub, yeah. Sub- Submariner is in the Defenders that I know. Hulk was in the Defenders that I know. Um, Dr. Strange in it. In yes. The, and so that yeah, was yeah. one thing that I didn't quite, one thing that I sort of like, okay, where's now maybe the comics evolved and that, that's who they are now. But I, to me, that was a bit jarring. And the same thing with the guardians of the galaxy. I also grew up reading. Oh yeah. 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 Guardians of the galaxy. And they were all, I mean, Yondu was in the guardians of the galaxy. Um, all these characters, um, None of the characters who were in the Guardians of the Galaxy, there was no raccoon, there was no tree guy. How, first of all, where did they get these things from? Did, is this from, did the comics change? The and comics did change in terms of How did of the they decide, theory. do you have to know how they decided to, which version of these various teams to use? For example, in the Avengers, the um, Ant-Man and the Wasp were original members, right? Yeah. Um, they didn't just sort of get tacked on later. Um, so, so do you know how they decided and on what basis they decided which versions of these great teams to to use? Well, I think that they had um, they had other more production oriented concerns that then dictated who's on a team or not. And one of the you know flexibilities of the the comics world is. If if they're if they're a you know a known character in the Marvel universe, they've probably been an Avenger at some point. They might have been a Defender at some point. Like even Wolverine, you know, yep. has been an Avenger. Yep. So, um, uh, they I think they used that flexibility, and they made other choices. Like, hey, we want to make something with a little more uh, lightheartedness. Um, you know, Paul Rudd's an incredibly talented guy. They they um, they actually originally started Ant Man out, I believe, with um, oh the director of uh, Drive, not Drive. Um, the guy who works with Simon Pegg all the time, Edgar Wright. Uh, Edgar Wright was originally going to do Ant Man, and so they thought his sensibility would really work really well with Paul Rudd. So I think it's I think they they chose the cinematic reasons first and then uh, 
slotted the you know properties accordingly. But like um, with the Guardians of the Galaxy, I would think cinematically it would have been easier to do the original Guardians of the Galaxy than to have a raccoon and a and having to animate a raccoon and a, a talking tree and stuff. Is that just well, because was, that's the more recent version of the Guardians in the comics that everybody knows? Yeah, yeah. The, the more recent was very successful. They had a sort of major comic event um, that was called Annihilation that was extremely well received, you know, critically and commercially. Um, so I think they they based it more on that era, uh, with the with the glaring exception of Chris Pratt. Chris Pratt is nothing like Star Lord in any incarnation of the comics, right? right. Um, and they just sort of retroactively said, "Okay, well, that's that's what this character is like now." And now, if you read a Guardians comic now, it's informed by Chris Pratt, not by the history of the character. Interesting. So now there's pollination going the other way. Yes, yes. Same thing with uh, uh, Robert Downey Jr. as Tony Stark. I mean, that's always. I mean, he was very similar to what everybody imagined the character being, but he was a little more Clark Gable esque in the comics. Yeah, he was uh, a little. He wasn't quite the kind of jokester in the comics, at least the seventies that I remember the comics when I was when I was collecting the most. Right. He was a bit more more serious, less jokey. <laughs> um, yeah. um, um, but overall, I thought that Johnny did was reminiscent to me of what I remember the Tony Stark character being yeah, yeah, at yeah. essence. Um, I thought the two weakest films in the, in the original, the f- one through three were one, one of them is everybody probably thinks that's one of the weakest films and that's the Captain Marvel movie. Um, but the other one is the one that's, that's a lot of people thought was, uh, was amazing. And that was black Panther. Um, I thought both of those were the weakest. Um, and in the case of, the case of Captain Marvel is partly because I do find Brie Larson very unlikable. Um, and I just, I never warmed to her character. The case of Black Panther, though, had nothing to do with the performances or anything, which I think were all terrific. It was more because I felt like it wildly oversized the superhero. I mean, Black Panther in the Marvel comics is one of the weakest, um, is one of the weakest superheroes in, in, at least the silver age of Marvel comics. And they just turned them in almost like godlikely powerful. Um, um, and the whole, they made the whole Wakanda thing. Oh, I thought kind of ridiculously over the top powerful. Um, I don't know exactly why in my darker moments, I think uh, it's a kind of pandering. Um, um, but I just felt that the black Panther I was watching was in no way reminiscent of the actual black Panther, whose comics I used to collect. Do you, do, do you have any feelings about either the Black Panther or, or Ms. Captain Marvel? I keep saying Ms. Marvel because, to me, Captain Marvel is a guy, and Ms. Marvel is the female, and, and I remember that from, again, the Silver Age of comics. So what are your thoughts on, on those two? Um, I, I would agree that Captain Marvel is one of my two least favorites of, of, the, uh, of the MCU. Um, I th- I don't lay that at Brie Larson's feet. I think she's she's fantastic. Um, I've liked her in other films, by the way. I didn't care for her in the superhero genre. Um, um, I don't think um, they quite knew what to do with the character, um, both in terms of the individual film and, and also her role in the ensemble, because she's just so over-superpowered uh, in the ensemble setting. Uh, it makes it difficult to have that chessboard that piece on the chessboard and still have stakes because she's so insanely powerful. Um, but that's, that's a revision itself, right? I mean, the original captain Marvel who was in the Avengers was not so wildly overpowered relative to everyone else. I mean, if you remember the end of the Korvac saga, captain Marvel gets one shotted just like everybody else by Korvac. Right. I mean, <laughs> I mean, he's, you know, as a matter of fact, the only one left standing at the end of that is Captain America. Um, interestingly enough, he, he's the actually the only one that Korvac doesn't kill. Um, um, and um, they all get revived, by the way. I mean, that's how it ends. But they're all killed. They're all dead. Korvac kills all of them. And um, so I didn't understand why did they overpower her so much, which well, then I, made I, it impossible it. for it to make any sense within the. 
they I think they went more, you know, because there were cosmic related aspects to the the threat. Um, and right, the, it's the Kree scroll stuff. I mean, it's yeah, it's, and, yeah. and that's going to keep coming. Yeah, um, and uh, be a big part of phases four and perhaps onward. Um, and I thought they kind of missed their mark because there was a there was a sort of soft reboot of the character in the comics. Um, oh, is that the is that true? Yeah, and that's where that's where the new uniform came from, and the the comics version was kind of more like a a riff on the right stuff, and mm. Carol Danvers military and that sounds interesting actually aviation yeah. uh, and, well, and they did include some of that in the film, but what we got in the film was a kind of disjointed thing that was hard to follow multiple time periods and, and weird kind of stuff, and I just I think that one was just kind of a you know, a missed opportunity. I, I got to disagree strongly on Black Panther, though. I I consider it one of the the better films. No, I know. I'm in a wild minority on this. Um, um, yeah, for for a number of reasons. I mean, uh, chief among them is uh, it has one of the most compelling villain antagonists uh, in the entire MCU, um, and the the contrast between uh, you know Killmonger and Black Panther the sort of uh, moral wrestling yeah. that they go yeah. through. Yeah. Th- None of that is my reason for disliking it. I, I, you know, if it hadn't been a superhero movie, I would have loved it. Right. Um, I just, did it strike you as not incongruous with the actual black Panther from Marvel comics? Well, I think the black Panther that I've uh, been associated with is, is a little bit further along in the trajectory and over so time, did they, oh, did they power him up in the comics as well? Because back um, in the seventies, he was more at the level of like the Luke Cages, and he mm-hmm. was not somebody who could go toe to toe against any of the sort of the the really powerful ones, right? Right. So did they they retconned him a little bit within the comics? They did do that, but I, I think less so on the power side and more so on Wakanda as a source of technology. Mm. Um, you know, he was often brought in in a scenario where, um, you know, the Avengers are facing some sort of threat. They've reached the limitations. Like, you know, the, the pecking order seems to be like, hey, there's this science stuff going on. You know, uh, Tony Stark can't handle this. Let's let's see if T'Challa can handle this. Oh, uh, he can't handle this. Let's call Reed Richards. You know, that's kind of how it goes. And Reed Richards is always too busy to deal with <laughs> all these mundane things. Right. So that's kind of how they slotted him in. So I, I think he was in, in, in keeping with that tradition. Yeah. I, I am aware that I am not, I'm so not well versed on the more contemporary meaning, like the last 25 years of these <laughs> franchises that they may have completely changed. And I'm just not aware of it. So, but so for someone old like me, I, it kind of stood up like, since when is black Panther this powerful? I mean, you know, I, um, I may surprise um, you, uh, one that I have very conflicted feelings on um, is Doctor Strange. Oh, and interesting! You weren't a f- you didn't like the Doctor Strange. Oh, I did very much, but there are there are a couple of major misgivings that I have. Uh, primary of which, um, I feel aesthetically it it borrowed too much from Christopher Nolan and not enough from Steve Ditko. Oh, you think it looked too much like Inception? <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, some of those, those, a lot of the magic effects were very inception looking. I agree with that. Yeah. Um, Although I'm somewhat sympathetic to the challenge of how to present those sorts of powers in a way that's not ridiculous. Um, yeah. 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 Um, and doesn't overshadow the powers of others in the, fr- in the, in the, in the franchise who actually are more powerful. Right. Um, yeah. Um, um, I, yeah. I guess I just was so blown away by Cumberbatch. Oh, I, yeah, I agree there completely. And I just, A, I'm a fan of the comics, and B, I've always just thought Dormammu was just, always just blew me away. And I thought the way they did Dormammu was really, really strong. Um, yeah, um, Dormammu looked great. Um, I, I'm kind of clinging to one thing that's it's not a fair criticism. I just always felt that Doctor Strange would have been a better character for a TV series. Um, a little bit... Um, more grounded. More, yeah, yeah, a little bit more grounded, at least in the beginning, um, before he, he goes off to all these other dimensions and everything. Yeah. Um, yeah. But um, yeah, no, no, he, he's I, I could see such that. great use. Like, after his origin story film, 
he's been great in everything, and I'm very much looking forward to the next one. All right. So let's talk about the future now. Let's talk about um, phase four and then afterwards, now that I know that the, all the five and six maps I've seen are, are bullshit. Um, let me... Um, before before yeah. we do that... Yeah, please, uh, whatever you want. One, one thing that we, uh, we skipped, yeah. um, I may be wrong on this, but one of the things that seems totally obvious in retrospect, um, I think it was a balls decision for Marvel to have the first Captain uh, America movie set in World War II. I think, like, if a big studio like Warner Brothers or Universal was in charge with it, the the suits that don't know anything about the comics, they'd be like, ah, nah, you know, we just want that in a flashback scene, you know. The kids wouldn't hip to it, you know. We need yeah. here and now. Yeah, you know, we, yeah. We need a TikTok video, you yeah. know. Um, so I think that decision was crucial. I agree. And, and, uh, an Look, in a lot of ways, MC, I mean, this is being a little bit, probably not, this is probably not true the way I'm saying it, but it feel it feels this way. I really do feel like MC is very much grounded in a kind of post-World War II cold war. I mean, that's when it actually came out. But mm-hmm. so much of the content of the comics, it seems to me, reflects the kinds of good and evil villain and hero dichotomies that really were set during the Second World War and carried through the Cold War. And I mm-hmm. guess that maybe part of the challenge, I guess one of the things I would say is that in that sense, the MCU is um, is somewhat retro in the sense that its, it's ethos is pre-fall of the Berlin Wall still to a certain extent, right? I mean, the way the way it man the the the, the kind of the the Manichaean des- design of it, right, mm-hmm. is very um, East West Soviet, you know, post post World War II Soviet American hegemony. So, I really thought that that worked, and I gather that that's going to get channeled in the Black Widow film, right? Because it's going to go back to Russia. Mm-hmm. And you're going to get to see some of the the backstory, and they're even going to introduce some 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 Soviet era superheroes, right? Mm-hmm. Um, the character, the actor who's from Stranger Things, is going to be playing an old grizzled pre pre fall the Berlin Wall Soviet superhero. Am I correct? I believe so. Yes. Yeah. I, yeah. I uh, I don't know for sure, but uh, yeah. I think you're David right Harbour is the name of the actor. Yeah. 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 Because with the trailer I've seen, I don't know if you've seen that Black Widow trailer, but it, oh, yeah, it's it looks freaking fantastic. amazing looking. Um, yeah. um, um, and he's like overweight, but he's still like a badass. <laughs> it, it just, it, it's terrific. Um, all right. Future. Um, so, I pull, I'm just pulling up on the screen the map. Yeah, for I've phase, got it here too. The map for Phase Four, which is the only you said accurate map. So it's Black Widow, Falcon, Winter Soldier, Eternals, Shang Chi, WandaVision, Doctor Strange, Loki, What If, Hawkeye, and then Thor. Um, just your initial before we get into sort of any deep dives. Initial thoughts on what. When you look at this and you ask yourself, okay, where does MCU think it's going? What is it doing next? What does this map tell you? I think this map tells me that um, they're ready to absorb the inevitable first consensus disappointment. I think that Somewhere in this phase four, there's there's the Vox think piece that's already in somebody's draft folder, ready to go. Has Marvel lost its way without its big stars and its big bad? Um, and I have a prediction as to which one of these is likely going to be. However, I, uh, I think that when we look back on phase four, there are going to be a handful of successes that um, – keep people interested, keep people feeling connected to this ongoing uh, expanding mythology. And there's going to be an infusion of new major talent and properties that have become available due to corporate mergering uh, in phase five and six. So 
I suspect in retrospect, phase four uh, may not be viewed as the, the, the favorite of everyone, but there are a number of uh, ideas in here that seem really enticing to me. Uh, Do you think that, let's start just big picture. Are they going to be, are they going to repeat this miracle again? Or is this overall, the next three going to be viewed ultimately as lesser? Um, I think inevitably they'll be viewed as somewhat lesser, but there are still a lot of juicy pieces of the Marvel comics universe that haven't been explored on the big screen that are or at least explored in a way, uh, you know, under proper stewardship um, that I think still has an opportunity to connect with audiences. And uh, the one key thing uh, let's, let's pray to the cinematic gods that this uh, tenuous um, agreement between Marvel and Sony can sustain um, having Spider-Man continue on as the, the, the spine of the, the Marvel universe going forward, which is his proper role in Marvel generally, I think is a crucial element to the ongoing success of the franchise. Mm. And this kid that they've got now, Tom Holland is just, you know, perfectly cast for the role. I think, I think he's fantastic. Um, none of, none of those are, cons- none of his films are considered uh, properly phase four at the moment. But um, I think that'll be part of the key success. I think the other big picture thing here is, you know, now they can, they can truly experiment with television as an extension. Um, and they're giving some filmmakers uh a lot of latitude in tone and direction in this new platform. Um, and that may be the most successful aspect of this phase is if one or two of those succeed, um, the, it opens up the possibilities even further. Okay. So there's two things I want to ask about now, maybe a little more specifically. Number one, do you believe that four five and six is going to be a similar accumulating elements to big team movies with a big baddie? Or is it going to try and do a different model, maybe a more decentralized model? Because my impression, at least of four, is that it's going to be a more decentralized model, that they're not going to try to repeat the logic of the of one through three. What do you think about that? I, I think it is going to be relatively more decentralized, um, I think that th- there's probably going to be multiple big baddies that cause the teams to uh, reunite. Um, I think there will be multiple Avengers movies that face threats that are, you know, at the scale where you need major collaboration among these characters. Yeah. And that's, that's the way it's happened in the comics forever. Um, you know, there's always some sort of, you know, they recycle them a lot, but there are a number of big bads or big scenarios that happen that uh, cause it to be an Avengers level or an event level storyline. And I think they're going to edge towards that. It's not clear which ones they will choose, but there are a number of major Marvel antagonists that have not been seen uh, in this universe yet that, that could yeah. provide either the single big bad role or the multiple big bad role. Yeah, we talked about this prof- uh, privately um, at some length. And my impression is that if the aim was to repeat one through three, accumulating up to, a, up to big team-up films, up to big baddie, in order to go beyond Thanos, you've got to do, it's got to be someone like Galactus, right? It has to be someone bigger than Thanos, Mm-hmm. And the only person I can think of that's known enough in the you know the, the, in the in the in the in the fan fan base that could fit that bill is Galactus. Um, Galactus is bigger than Thanos, and he's very very publicly recognizable. There are others who are bigger than Thanos, and actually who are bigger than Galactus, but they belong to some pretty obscure books um, to a mm-hmm. great extent, right? Um, now you thought that it's going to be Doctor Doom. I th- yeah, I think but I don't think good. Dr. Doom's not big enough to be the big baddie. So that would if if that's the case then it's going to be more of this 
decentralized, right? Where it's going to be maybe Dr. Doom collaborating for, with some big baddie or working for some big baddie or. Right. Um, I, I think the, the move that they, and they've done this in the comics a few times where a very powerful entity can be uh, put towards Dr. Doom's uses without that entity really realizing that that's what they're doing. Uh, so he's, he's sort of like the, the mastermind pulling the strings. Um, I'm intrigued by the idea of Doom as a major player in uh, phases five and six, because in many ways he's, um, uh, he's a mirror image of Tony Stark. Um, he's got a metallic um, persona. He's a, he's a leader. Uh, he's interested in technology, but he's scarred and not very uh, outward going. Um, and, and he's always got a, a moral mission in his head. And I think that's what made Thanos such a compelling character, uh, at, brilliantly portrayed by Brolin. Um, you know, he's got an ethos, and he's going he's gonna to put his will in the universe that way. And Galactus is just such an impersonal threat. I think Galactus would need to be in concert with some other element to make it work as a movie. Uh, on the page, Galactus is it can be compelling because you can access you know other concepts through narration, but uh, on the big screen, um, it might be difficult. An idea of like another purple bad guy from space might seem like you know might seem like they're trying to repeat Thanos, even yeah. though that is what yeah. it would be. That would that would worry me if. Marvel wasn't in control. Like that would worry me in a more traditional situation where the studio people, you know, don't know anything about this. Like, Oh, another purple big guy from space. We can't have that. I mean, Marvel knows that giant purple guy from space really does not very well capture right. the difference between Gal- you know, the similarities between Galactus and Thanos. Um, yeah. um, but no, I agree with you in terms of the difficulty of realizing Galactus in the medium. Mm-hmm. I mean, Thanos was still at a relatively understandable scale, right? Yeah. He yeah. just had a really powerful glove. Yeah, he was a powerful alien otherwise, but, you know, he was still within... Look, without the glove, Hulk would have pul- pulverized him in about three seconds, right? I mean, it would. <laughs> I mean, Galactus is not on a normal scale. Like, Galactus yeah. is a planet devourer, right? I mean, I mean, it, you know, Galactus is so powerful that... that it's hard to know how you would represent it in a visual right. medium in a way that, that in comics you're not restrained by. So I, I, t- I tend to agree with that. I think Dormammu would also be a great villain. What Now, whether Dormammu is only continues to be used within Doctor Strange or whether Dormammu now becomes a big baddie for everyone, I think, um, I, I don't know, but it could be interesting. Um, but I tend to think, and I, and I agree with you on this, that, that they're not going to go to repeat one to three they're going to go for something different. And that then sort of brings me to my second question. Looking at phase four, one of the things that strikes me about it is there some pretty um, marginal comic franchises in here. Mm-hmm. Marginal in the sense that they were never hugely popular. Marginal in the sense that they don't really have any very identifiable heroes and villains in them. And I'm, tr- you know, at least three. So there's one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. Three of them, Eternals, Shang Chi, and What If, strike me as quite out as outliers. Mm-hmm. And why? Do you have any sense of why? What is your opinion of why? And I don't know how much of this is known, and it would just be speculation. Why are they doing this as opposed to? all the far more wrecking. In other words, why leave Fantastic Four to phase five or six and not have it be in phase four, right? Why have, why have what if at all? I mean, that's just a weird, it's not even really a, a superhero franchise, right? I mean, I remember the what if books, at least back from the seventies and they, they were pretty much you know, what freestanding for the most part. Um, um, what are your thoughts about these somewhat outlier franchises being brought in and some very obvious things just sort of being left out. Well, I think that a number of these things are just pure cynical uh, business choices. Um, I, I think they had to have the pipeline 
set for these films before the merger with Fox happened. So Fantastic Four was not really a viable choice in this in the way that they normally do business. Uh, and especially in the sense that they've kind of exhausted the supply of actors out there. I mean, every brilliant talented actor out there has, has played one superhero at this point. And so it might be worthwhile to wait a little bit of time before you have to recast something like the mutant characters, because that's a whole ensemble right there. Yeah. And the fantastic four, that's an ensemble, even though it's only four, um, and it's crucial to get those right. They do. There is a major rumor that they might get two of those very well. I don't know if you've heard these rumors. No. Say a little uh, bit about it. Uh, Josh Krasinski from A Quiet Place and his wife, Emily Blunt, as Mr. and Mrs. Fantastic. Mm, that um, would be good. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think that would – they would be really good, so – uh, that, but yeah, I, I I agree with you on the marginal nature, especially of Eternals and Shang Chi. Uh, I have a theory about okay. Eternals. Shang Chi and What If strike me as the honest. The um, I think Shang Chi uh, is part of their their strategy in uh, you know courting China as a major audience mm, as a market. Uh, market and interesting here's here's the thing though uh if you had just told me three years ago hey they're gonna make a film of this it would have it would have maybe felt like a stretch but i'm i'm feeling they might have a little bit of lightning in the bottle on this one um i don't know if you've seen the introductory footage where they announced the casting and the director at san diego comic-con yes i did Uh, both of these guys seem uh, vibrant and just brimming with, you know, vitality and charisma. Um, the director is very acclaimed from some very uh, grounded smaller films, indie films. And this this kid that they've cast as the title character, uh, I think his name, what is his name? Simu Liu. It just, he's so darn likable within four seconds on, on my screen. Like, I'm, I'm, I'm all on board with really looking forward to this one. Um, my, my theory about the Eternals was, was, was that they kind of painted themselves into a corner. If they want to have big baddies, they've painted mm-hmm. themselves in a little bit of a corner. And that is they've phased out some of the, they're phasing out some of the most powerful people that are in the, that were in one through three. I mean, vision is gone, Right. Thor, I guess they're going to reboot. I, I shudder a little bit at the at the thought of of Natalie Portman being Thor. I I, I I praying that that is not the train wreck. I'm worried it's going to be, in the sense of just me being not credible even visually. Just like sort of looking at it and saying, okay, no, I I, I don't believe that Natalie Portman is beating the shit out of you know Galactus, right? Um um, and I almost wonder whether they're doing Eternals because they need some much more powerful people. Mm-hmm. in the universe in order to be credible opposition to whatever big baddie they comes next, whether it's Galactus or, or, um, you know, um, because the, we're, we're looking at a much weaker Avengers, right? Presuming right. that there's going to be more Avengers. It's a much weaker group than, than the one that we've had so far. I also, am just a little surprised. There's so many characters strong, powerful characters that have been Avengers to tap that they're just not tapping. I mean, one that comes right to mind, one of the most powerful members is Wonder Man, right? Mm-hmm. Nowhere to be, nowhere to be found. Right. And I don't see, he's not, I don't see him in four or five, even the bullshit fives and sixes. So I wondered whether they were doing, you know, bringing Eternals to just sort of boost the power. But then the question is why do that? Why not use some of the very well-known characters that we already have in the comic universe um, and just bring them over. Do you you have any thoughts about these kinds of choices? I think think that's an excellent, uh, that's an excellent theory. Uh, Eternals is the one that I, I feel is going to be a commercial and critical disappointment. It feels to me 
sort of how I felt about the Defenders Netflix shows. Like, well, we've got to have another one. Let's let's do one. It doesn't feel or that horribly like, aborted in humans that they tried oh, to yeah, do. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. yeah. It doesn't feel like it has a point of view or a place, um, and it um, it also kind I, of goes very into deep lore that I bet you um, most people don't know. Like, yeah, like it goes into deep lore that like includes like people like the Watcher and like all sorts of stuff that, unless you were really a hardcore collector, you wouldn't even be aware, right? I mean, right, um, right, right. Um, so. Yeah. Um, and what about What If? Um, well, are you aware that What If is just an animated TV series? No. I read the What Ifs back, like I said, in the 1970s, and I just couldn't see how that could fit into. So what is What If now? It's, it's going to be an animated TV series on Disney+. Plus. And one of the interesting things is this will be a venue to bring back some of the phase one through three actors voicing their original characters. Oh, context. Oh, okay. Okay. So like one of the first ones that they showed some storyboards from is like, what if uh, Peggy Carter took up the, you know, super soldier serum and kind of took the place of Captain America. Right. Sort of thing. Right. Um, right. And uh, I love the what if comics. I just didn't see how they were fitting here. But now that you're saying that and I'm seeing, yes, it's a Disney show. It's not, it's not going to be a a feature film. Now, now I understand a little better. Um, WandaVision, I take it is in the past because vision is dead. They have hinted in the uh, press rollout that it is actually post uh, end game and how they're going to, Circle that square about bringing about vision is, okay. you know, TBD. Um, I have to partly recuse myself from talking about this one. Uh, a good friend of mine's wife is the showrunner on it. I don't That's know fine. anything about it, but it That's looks fine. pretty compelling to me. That's fine. That's fine. Because um, vision, I, I was a little surprised when they killed him. Um, uh, it seemed like he was there for five minutes and then they just got rid of him. And yeah. he is one of the top three or four most powerful Avengers. Um, um, and to, to just get rid of him as you go into phase four, um, as you go into the next three phases struck me as an odd choice. Um, let me ask you one more thing um, because we should probably wrap up as we're getting near to an hour and a half. Um, my pet thing, that's not your pet thing, um, um, but just your opinion about it. I am a little worried that the current climate the current woke wokeness situation that we have in the country Mm -hmm. is going to negatively affect these franchises. Do you have a feeling about any feelings about that? Um, I've already heard people bitching and complaining about Shang-Chi in what respect? Oh, that it's racist. Kung Fu China, Kung Fu Chinaman. Right. I've already heard people saying that kind of thing. And I'm wondering whether, we're now going to have, this is now going to be this tedious sort of terrible aspect of our politics is now going to affect these films. Or do you think MCU is so fucking huge? It can resist it. The, uh, I, I, I kind of find that fascinating as an angle. I, um, because when the Netflix iron fist came about, the, the, the woke uh, side of... Uh, were mad that he wasn't Asian? <laughs> they were mad that he wasn't Asian. They wanted, they wanted to cast an Asian Iron Fist. Um, and so... So now it's funny that now they're casting an Asian. They're not complaining about it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, and a, a number of people spoke back against that idea, saying that, well, wait a minute, if you, if you go this route then you're going to be playing into a, a potential cliche. There was an interesting dialogue in, in that controversy. Uh, there was a very narrow slice of people who were reasonable in that discussion. Uh, a very so narrow hard. slice of reasonable, that which yeah. sounds sort of like everything, right? <laughs> right, right. Um, I think um, uh, Sam Liu, the, the actor that's going to be Shang-Chi, his, uh, his sort of immigrant uh, personal story of being from China, but raised in Canada uh, will add an interesting dimension to it. And, um, and may immunize the film from some of those criticisms. Yeah. Yeah. And I think the director, I think he's Hawaiian. 
Uh, I may be wrong on that, uh, but he's a person of color. And so I think, um, I think they will be able to both treat the material appropriately and handle those concerns in, in a way that um, doesn't allow that particular film to be brought into one of these uh, controversies. Um, I, I understand you're bristling at uh, uh, Natalie Portman as Thor and perhaps being concerned that this is generated from a similar place. However, I don't know whether it is. I'm, I'm specul. I'm worried that it is. And I'm just oh, wait, worried that you. I'm worried that it's not going to be visually credible. Yeah, I'm I'm worried about that visual as well. Um, the interesting thing, it this idea actually comes from a recent uh, a recent comic run that was brilliant. Uh, the guy that's been writing Thor recently is is on quite a amazing run, and but the problem I see. Um, a lot of the compelling part of that comic run was there was just this female Thor from out of the blue. Um, and half of the intrigue was trying to figure out who this was, but we're going into this already knowing who she is. Right. It's the character that's from the beginning. That was his love interest. And yeah, you're, so you're more worried about that aspect of it. Yeah. That's the part. I, and I, but I also share your concern that, um, you know, just the visual dynamics are, are going to be tricky to pull off. But I, I have enough faith in the way that they've they've. I hope they don't muscle her up. That's going to be even worse than if they <laughs> eat like CGI muscle her up or something horrible <laughs> like that. Like, oh, oh my god. Um, <laughs> all right. <laughs> Any last thoughts? Anything you want to say that we haven't talked about in terms of MCU where it's going? Are you overall hopeful? Even if it's not at the same level of one to three, are you overall hopeful that whatever it is is going to be a very satisfying and again impressive achievement? Yeah, I, I think there are a lot of things to look forward to. Um, I have a personal pet uh, wish that I I don't think will happen, but I would love to see an Avengers movie with the antagonist being a character known as the Beyonder. Um. And in the comics, uh, you know, this could potentially spoil something, but what the Beyonder does is he takes all of the heroes and villains off to a planet and makes them fight. And I have a dream casting scenario. I, I would love to see Tom Cruise play this character. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, he could and, be great. Yeah. And, um, you know, it's one of those things where, you know, it, it could play like a reality show, uh, you know, elimination phase sort of thing. Uh, it, could, it could spawn video games. And yeah, uh, I, I, I think it, it, it could be an easy success. Um, I don't know if they're going to go there and do that one, but I would love to see it. Well, I think you should pitch it. Wait until you become <laughs> really hugely uh, successful and influential with this graphic novel and then pitch it to them. <laughs> All right. <that's> what we'll <laughs> All right. Milton Dawson. Thank you so much. Always a pleasure geeking out with you. Um, Thanks for having me on. I, I forget how old I am when we, when we talk. Um, it puts me back in the mind of, of the 10 year old me that loved these, these comics and, um, and the films have done that for me too. They really d did revive a lot of childhood, really good childhood feelings watching these movies. And I hope yeah. that they, I hope that they continue to do that. All right, my friend, take care and we'll see you on the next time around. All right. Thanks a bunch. Ciao.